Let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us all here this morning. We enjoy getting into your word and learning what we can about your word. And um, it's learning the deep riches of Christ in Christology is uh, such a blessing, God, to learn what you are to us and why and the things that you're doing and why you do them. It's, it's a blessing, God, but even as we struggle to grasp all these things, we know there's so many nuances and things that are beyond our reach and grasp that we will see one of these days that you're coming. We thank you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so Christology, we are in the return of Christ, the second coming. And uh, this is not going to be really deep and comprehensive the way you normally would get a lesson on the second coming or next week on the kingdom and the millennium. Because it's Christology, it's kind of a Reader's Digest condensed, and it focuses mostly on things pertaining specifically to Christ. Obviously, it's, there's a great deal more breadth and, and depth to the, uh, the return of Christ than what you normally get under the subject of Christology, which is more of kind of a, like I said, a Reader's Digest condensed. Um, if you want, have your Bibles, just to start off real quick, let's take a look at John 14. John chapter 14. Beginning verse 1, he said, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, or other translations will more correctly say, In my Father's house are many rooms, or various versions of that. Or in my Father's mansion are many rooms. I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. So this is just an, one example to start that off, start this whole lesson off of uh, Christ's return and his promise to return. This is kind of basic, and we all know, at least on some level, um, it, most babes in Christ know about the expectation of a second coming, that Jesus is supposed to come again someday. What all that looks like and all the nuances and things um, are, are where sometimes people will disagree. Um, is Jesus going to return and come straight back to the earth? Is there going to be a rapture first? And if there's a rapture, is it in the middle or sometime in, in between, or is it in the end? And uh, that's not going to be the point of of this particular lesson here today is to go into all of that. That would be more under, um, eventually once we get to eschatology, and eschatology is a fancy way of saying it's the study of the end times. But when you get into that, that's when you get into all the different viewpoints and perspectives on second coming and the rapture and all that. I do have a handout that I'll hand out in just a minute. I'll get maybe this young man over here to help me out. Um, so this is going to be a very brief overview on an extensive topic um, on Christ. Hermeneutics is uh, it's a fancy word that gets handed around, and, and just I don't want to I never want to assume everybody knows what the term hermeneutics is or any other term, but it's um, really it's the science of interpreting scripture. Some people say it's, uh, it's really more of an art. I think if we, interpreting scripture, it becomes more art if you stray away from just taking the Bible as a normal read and interpreting the Bible literally. It says what it means and it means what it says. And if there is symbolism, symbolism is usually indicated in the context most times you'll read down a few verses and it'll give us the meaning. It's, and a uh, perfect example of that is several times as you're reading Daniel, the book of Daniel. Daniel will come, maybe Gabriel will describe to him um, this, or give him this vision. God will give him a vision. Uh, Gabriel's there. It happens in a couple different ways. And then... Um, you know, in one particular case, the Lord says, Gabriel explained to him what's going on, the meaning of it. 
So you, you might get a vision, and it's all symbolism. Daniel wouldn't understand, but then a few verses later, Gabriel is explaining the, the meaning of the vision. So this is what happens most times in Scripture. Now, where hermeneutics, interpreting Scripture, becomes more of an art, is if you stray away from that and you wander into figurative language, symbolism. Because then it's, it's kind of wide open. Let me, let me um, and the reason why I'm bringing up hermeneutics is because, you know, there could be a lot of division among the brethren, unfortunately, and there is different perspectives on, you start, as soon as you start going into particularly end times or sometimes um, ecclesiology, things having to do with church, all kinds of interpretation and things get imposed upon the scripture according to how you were brought up, what you learned in Bible college, what you learned at your former church and Sunday school, what have you. So we bring that along with us and we tend to pour those into the scripture we're reading instead of what we really should be doing is the other way around, right? We don't want to impose an idea and see how we can wedge it into this passage that we're reading. What we want to do is we want to try to pull the meaning out. So that's the difference is eisegesis, where you're putting meaning into the text, or exegesis, where you are um, getting the meaning out of the text, what the author originally meant. And that, that's one of the reasons why um, we're in love with the model that we have here at the Master's Church is because verse by verse interpretation, exegesis of the scripture. So I'm going to, uh, I, I'm going to, uh, Run down real quick four points that you can, you can get from me later if you like, or I can send it to you, but some examples of what hermeneutics means and how we apply it to Scripture. And this is going to be really brief because, again, in the interest of time. But number one, Scripture interprets Scripture. Often scripture interprets itself. In some instances, another book of the Bible will interpret a troublesome passage. The Holy Spirit is the author of all. That's the principle that's involved. So we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. Um, it's great, I will say, to go to commentaries, to get recordings from your pastor or your favorite speaker somewhere. But the final authority, the ultimate authority is going to be scripture. And if there's a conflict... If you're reading the scripture and you understand a passage one way, and then this passage understand another way, guess who's wrong? Exactly, yeah. So that means you've got to dig deeper and try to figure out how to understand them where they both work. Context interprets scripture. The surrounding verse, chapters, and the book itself, who it's written to and so forth, provide immediate context to a verse, as does the historical the cultural and linguistic um, surroundings, uh, linguistic context, like uh, idioms. You know, my mom used to say things like, you know, if, if you come stomping in here in your wet shoes again, I'm going to slap you in the middle of next week. You know, if you take it that literally, that means, you know, she's going to make me time travel. But what it, you know, we, so we understand that different languages, different cultures have different idioms. So we have to understand these so we can understand the scripture we're reading. Even the passage I just read has a Hebrew idiom in it that applies to the ancient Hebrew wedding tradition that I won't go into right now. But there's some context with that in, in um, going to my father's house and preparing a room for you. So also intent interprets scripture. All scripture has an intended Meaning, and that's what authorial intent is. It is therefore true that a passage has one correct interpretation while it can have many applications. The example I just gave is one correct interpretation of it, but you can apply it toward Jesus' second coming, but you can also look at it, interpret it in light of the ancient Hebrew wedding tradition, right? So there's different applications. Um, the clear interprets the obscure. So no passage of scripture should be interpreted in a way that contradicts another or the overall message of the scripture. When we are faced with an obscure verse, we find a clear verse or two to help us interpret. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? See, I knew you all knew this stuff probably anyway, so 
Let's go. Let's look at some examples of this. Um, if you want, you can turn to these. Feel free. Uh, Isaiah chapter two. This is verses two to four. We'll look at real quick. Um, the importance of. I'm going to say there's different forms of hermeneutic. Now, what we tend to follow here at, and encourage here at the Master's Church is more of a literal approach to Scripture. Now, literal does not mean the same thing as modern Western English, where literal means you take it exactly what it says, and that's what it means. Jesus says, I am the door. Hinges, doorknob, wood. You know, it doesn't mean, literal just means interpret the Scripture normally. As you normally read it, you would understand whether it's symbolism or not. If you're reading the book of Revelation and you see a giant red dragon, it's got seven heads and ten horns, is there anything like that in existence in really on the earth right now? You would hope not. So it's probably symbolism. This gets verified as you keep reading the scriptures and you go, oh, here's the meaning. So that's what we do. We approach scripture, we read it normally. I want to say kind of like the way you would read a normal book or um, you know, a newspaper article or a magazine article. The author, depending on who it is, in this case here, it's going to be Isaiah, is intending to communicate something. He's not trying to make it confusing. God, when he interprets scripture, is it's been said he speaks baby talks because he is so far above us way down here. He's speaking in terms that are the best way for us to understand it. And sometimes you know, we're the ones who are confused about how to do that. So Isaiah chapter 2 how can, tell me if this can be spiritualized as opposed to understanding it literally. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Really tough to spiritualize that one, don't you think? Um, let's look at another example here. Well, let's continue. There's another verse here. He shall Verse 4 says, He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes. So there's going to be a, a situation where, here where this particular kingdom is not everybody's perfect, right? They shall beat their swords into plowshares. So at some time they had swords. Their spears into pruning hooks. At some point they had spears, so that's probably not like up there before the throne of God, right? Unless it's the angels or the living beasts. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. So at one time they did. So this puts the context here is somehow earth and sometime future, sometime future, somehow future, because this hasn't happened yet. Another example, a couple chapters up, Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. What's that speaking of? There's symbolic language, but what's that speaking of? What's that? Somebody said it. Jesus. Perfect. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Verse 5, righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lay down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned, chi weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. Now, we encourage that today. 
So clearly we're not in a situation today where we have kingdom on earth today because no way are you going to let anybody play with cobras or adders or anything, right? So this, again, you have to interpret this as a future type of an event. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's not so much the case right now, is it? Not yet. Um, also, the, another example would be there are sometimes offered up a spiritualized view of uh, Revelation chapter 7. We'll take a look at this real quick, if you, if you like. Revelation 7 shouldn't be too hard to find. Let's look at verses uh, 4 to 8. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. They were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Anyway, he names all of these tribes all the way down. And then verse 9, let's take a quick look at verse 9. So 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel. And then verse 9, he says, After these things I looked, behold, a great multitude, aside from this 144,000, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Now, some interpretations will take that passage about the 144,000 and spiritualize it and try to make it somehow about the church. But you got a problem because you got, if this is the church, it says it's Israel, and it names the tribes, and it gives very specific numbers. And then if that's the church, then who are these great multitude, which no one can number with the white robes that are before the throne? See, so there's complications. So the best approach to Scripture is, is just kind of take it straight forward. So we should know the, the first coming of Messiah. We all know that it was prophesied many times in the Old Testament, right? And particularly in Isaiah. It was, and Jesus, did he, he, when he came the first time, was it fulfilled literally and physically on the earth? Yes, we know he was born in Bethlehem, etc. He was physically, literally here on the earth. All these prophecies told us about him. And yet uh, the prophets didn't expect a spiritual fulfillment of it when they read it. They expected a literal one. So why would the uh, prophecies concerning the future second coming be any different? Why would it be a spiritual coming and not a physical coming? And, and by what precedence? If I, if I can have help, I got a little handout here. I want you, you can take home. Can you help me there, young man? Awesome help. This is, but I don't want to. I appreciate it. Um, on the front, is this handy dandy little chart? Let me know if you want a, a digital copy of it. Sometimes having a, a PDF file, if you like that. Um, since you can email it to somebody is, is great, or if you want an image copy of it, because sometimes you, know, you might not want to share it with somebody on a, uh, Facebook or some other. So you can do that. I'll send it to you. You let me know. On the back, is the second coming important? So if you take a look at that, this is just some moving on now to second coming statistics, the data here. This is fascinating to me. For every time in the Bible the first coming is mentioned, the second coming is mentioned eight times. The Bible gets more into the second coming than the first. Does that give you any confidence? Because he succeeded in the first time fulfilling that one. Prophecy occurs, and thank you, sir, occurs in one-fifth of the scriptures. Wow, that's almost 20%. I'm just kidding. Let's see who's awake. The second coming accounts for a third of that. There are over 660 general prophecies, half concerned Christ. Of these 333 prophecies, just 109 were fulfilled in the first coming. This leaves 220, 224 yet to be fulfilled in his second coming. Of the 46 Old Testament prophets, less than 10 of them speak of the first coming, 36 concern his second coming. 
In the Old Testament, 1,845 references to Christ's rule on the earth. 17 Old Testament books give prominence to this. In the New Testament, 318 references to the second coming. It's mentioned in 23 of the 27 New Testament books. Next to the subject of faith, the second coming is the most dominant of the New Testament. For every time the atonement is mentioned, the second coming is mentioned twice. Jesus referred to his return 21 times. So now what we're going to do is we're going to get into all these verses and passages. Uh, just kidding. Well, you, clearly, you can see why we have to, we have to do really a brief on this, because this, this would be impossible. But I hope you enjoy the handout. Let me know if you want more or want one for some, uh, to hand out to anybody else. So that's the st statistical data. So clearly, the second coming is a big deal, a bigger deal somehow than the first coming. The focus of all Scripture, when you get to Revelation, for instance, it's the penultimate um, focus of all eternity right there at the second coming. The only thing that rivals that and doesn't really rival it, it complements it, really is the cross, the Passion Week, and the resurrection. But it's all about we were enemies with Christ, now we're made friends, and then we get the fulfillment of that. So everything else after that is almost subtext, but it's all really around the second coming and, and everything um, coming to its peak at that point. Uh, about the second coming language, okay, language. In the Greek, about the second coming, is the Greek word parousia. Some people will call it parousia. But most Greek experts will pronounce it parousia. It don't matter. It's a fancy Greek word and it's not English, but it just means the presence, the presence in Christ's second coming. Matthew 24, if you want to turn, turn there, I always encourage flip your pages, flip your Bible, um, as often as possible because the exercise is good and it sticks in your brain better if you're seeing it while you're hearing it. But there's four different verses where this is used. In Matthew 24, verse 3, it says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, I, uh, Olives, on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these tell us when I just wrapped, I just, you know, got my tongue wrapped around my eye teeth and couldn't see what I was saying. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end, end of the age? So coming there would be the parousia, the second coming that he's talking about there. And then skip up to verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as were the days of Noah in verse 37, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And they were unaware until the flood came, in verse um, 39 here, sorry, and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So those are some examples. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2, you can look at verse 8. And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Perusia. And then you can flip over real quick to James. James 5, verses 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Amen to that. Yes. Right. We are as even. Right. But all of these devils, 
Yeah. Well, it's not entirely an error. I mean, what you're saying is true, but we also know that these things will escalate, you know, whether it's um, Paul or Jesus said that he gave various signs, and a lot of the signs have to do with things being evil, and we read that some of that in some of the epistles, and, and how that um, you know, people's love will grow cold, and children will become more rebellious. So I think what it is, is it's the evil has always been there, will always be there, but there, it, there is an escalation to it like birth pangs, where, you know, most of us in our neighborhoods, we used to be able to play out of doors, play outside, play in the yard, didn't worry about it. You know, we knew it was time to come in in the evening when the street lamps came on, right? You know, better get in, mom's gonna give me a whooping kind of a deal. Nowadays, though, you know, I don't know, and that was, there were some evil places, some bad neighborhoods you didn't want to go near when you were a kid, but now, you know, it, it does have to do with his, his timing, yeah, absolutely. You, and you read in Revelation, too, you read a lot um, about his appointed time and about um, the appointed time for, um, you know, a bad end to be released from the pit. So a lot of appointed time. So God has his time for everything, and everything happens at the time he chooses, at the time he picks, because he's sovereign God. So that's exactly right. But now, this, I, I don't want to confuse anything here, and I don't want to miscommunicate something, too. And that is that the word parousia about the coming also does apply to the rapture, rapture verses. Um, let me give you four examples real quick. Um, all in First Thessalonians. Well, the first one's, at least the examples I'm giving are First Thessalonians chapter two, verse nineteen. For what is our hope of joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at His coming? Is it not you? And in the context, he starts getting more and more into um, the rapture. Another famous rapture passage and this verse is just called out of that chapter 3 verse 13 so that he may, may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our god and father at the coming of our lord jesus with all his saints first thessalonians 4 15 for this we declare to you by a word from the lord that we who are alive, we who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. And 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as a footnote, although some people will use it, I'd say that first that Thessalonians 3.13, I say I don't really see rapture in that passage, but some people do. But um, what the rapture teaching is, is not a second coming as in, we know when Christ returns, a lot of the famous passages we get, like in Zechariah's, he sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives and it splits north and south, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Second coming is... Um, you know, we meet the Lord in the air. So those are two different things there. It is a type of a coming, but it's not coming all the way. And again, there's some, pull me aside sometime and I can hook you up res with resources. It's an interesting teaching, but it parallels the ancient Hebrew wedding tradition and, and what happens there and the way the bridegroom comes for his bride and doesn't come all the way. He comes only to the gates. Grabs her. The procession goes all the way to the Father's house. They're locked in for seven years. So it's a fascinating study. Um, other thing with language uh, in, interpretation, you've probably heard the term before. How many of you have heard the term apocalyptic language? Apocalyptic language? Okay. That just means, you know, and you watch any science fiction movie or something on TV or TV shows, and they go, ah, that's the apocalypse. You know, like it means doom. Apocalypse means doom, right? Actually, it does not. It gets used that way a lot, but apocalypsis, it means to uncover, to unveil, to reveal. 
So a lot of times when people apply, oh, this, you can't really understand what the meaning of that symbolism is. It's apocalyptic language. So in other words, it's this language that has to do with the end times that we can't really, you know, it's apocalyptic language. Well, if it's apocalyptic language, it should be revealing, it should be not clouding or veiling. The book of Revelation is the apocalypsis. So it's not the book of obfuscation. It's the book of Revelation. So it reveals about Christ. It's not trying to confuse us. God is not the author of confusion. So again, I reject the notion personally that there is even such an animal as apocalyptic language, if you want to call it that. There are certain texts in the Bible that have to do with prophecy and talk about the end times. But um, I don't see any reason to, to say, well, um, you know, it's all symbolism. We can't figure it out. Therefore, it's apocalyptic. Now, now, I'm not saying there aren't some confusing and challenging passages. I mean, amen to that. Um, and I've been dealing with them a lot lately, you know, being in the book of Revelation and so forth. But the apocalypse is not that. Apocalyptic means it's an unveiling. It's a, re it's a revealing. And this is where we find most of the teaching concerning um, the culmination of all the events of the Bible is in the book of Revelation, right? So we got all these events happening, and they're all the things that lead in and lead up to the second coming. Uh, for, here's an example. 1 Corinthians 1, about an apocalypse. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 7 and 8 so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless, in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one such example where the word apocalypse is, is used. Also, Second Thessalonians, we were just there. Maybe I should have gone to that one first. Sorry, folks. Uh, Second Thessalonians 1.7. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. This tells us kind of the nature a little bit of how he returns to reveal. That's apocalypse. First Peter 1 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, let's see, 1 Peter 1.13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully. And hope means expectation. Does it mean, oh, gee, I hope so. Hope in the Bible means your expectation, Okay. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then uh, 1 Peter, same book, chapter 4, verse 13. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So now in the time we have, let's take a look real quick at... Um, that's of some verses. Who wants to get Matthew 24, 30? We're going to look at Jesus Christ, how he will return with all power and authority in his glory. Matthew 24, 30, who can get that one? Jason, who can get Titus 2, 13? Okay. I need someone for Revelation 1, 7. Well, Jason's already got it. Oh, we got one. We need a Revelation 1 7. We need a Matthew 25. It's a longer passage, 31 to 46. Ha. <laughs> okay, you got Lexus got a long passage. 2 Peter 3 12. Thank you. Uh, how about Revelation 19 2? All right, I'll get that one. All right, let's start with the Matthew 24. Matthew 24 30. Amen. Did everybody hear that okay? 
Titus 2.13, one of my favorite verses. Amen. Revelation 1, 7. So, so he's coming and he's returning to the earth. All the tribes of the earth are going to be watching him come. And they're going to be shocked and surprised and a little bit bummed out, right? <laughs> Matthew, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, long passage. So he's coming in glory, and it's all good news for us, but he's also coming in judgment, right? That's the ultimate fulfillment of the glory of Christ is that his justice is fulfilled, his love is fulfilled, all in his glory, all the attributes of God come to bear, all the things he's told us um, leading up to this point. At Luke 9.26, I'll read this one real quick. He says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words... Of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Uh, Revelation 19, there's a handful of verses there. We're not going to read the whole chapter, although I would encourage you to if you have not. Verse, verse 2 is the first one I look at. Um, for true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And that's common language used even in the Old Testament having to do with worshiping false gods, false idols. Verses 11 to 13, he says, um, John writes, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. There's symbolic language, but it's clear what the meaning is, right? And his, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And then down verse 16. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. So those are some passages about what it's going to look like when he comes in his power and in his authority. If the Father, 
The Father has already given the Son all of his authority, though, right? Remember John, John 5, 27. Let me get there real quick. John 5, 27. And he has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Um, that's about all there is. We have time for today anyway, but Matthew 26, the end of each of the Gospels, he talks about things concerning his, um, his second coming. There's a ton of verses. So again, the entire apocalypse, the entire book of Revelation concerns the focus of events concerning his return. So, uh, do we have any questions at this time? Anything to add? So we see why studying, I hope, we see why studying the end times and end times prophecy and things like that are important. Because there's actually more about the future, our future in the second coming, and including there's a lot of bad speculation, but there's more about that than there is the first coming, right? So obviously, obviously it's a big deal. Uh, if, you, if you like, I, I want to show you something else, and this is something else that should be noticed too, and I... I Another verse occurs to me, and I have to stop before any more do. But in First John, let's see, make sure I got the passage right. First John three. Um, doo -doo -doo. This is another reason why how uh, this hope in the second coming is important to us. First John three three says, "And everyone who has this hope in Him." purifies himself just as he is pure. So that's where we should be, is purifying ourselves in our walk with Christ just as he's pure. We don't want to be ashamed or embarrassed when he comes, right? So it should affect our walk. With that, I want to thank you very much. I've got one note for you. as a homework assignment for next week, looking at the kingdom a little bit. And that is... Look at the kingdoms named in Nebuchadnezzar's statue in um, Daniel chapter 2. And tell me what the takeaway is from that about the kingdom of God. Daniel chapter 2 about Nebuchadnezzar's statue. Tell me what the takeaway is. And you can, I won't necessarily put you on the spot next week. You can send me an email or call me or drop me a text if you think you might know what the answer is. But I'm going to challenge you to take a look at that passage in Daniel 2 and let me know what that tells us in the nature of the coming kingdom of Christ. All right. Thank you all for your attention. So what is, these are some of the verses. If you didn't get a chance to grab them as I was just now reading them, if you want to snap a photo, come and get it. Thank you all.